Hi, welcome to Big Thinkers, Big Ideas. I'm Dr. Carla O'Dell, CEO of APQC. And in this series, I get to interview some of the most interesting people in the world. So today, I'm talking to Scott Sunshine, who is a distinguished professor at Rice University and a consultant to Fortune 500 and dot-com executives, and was in the dot-com bust, which we might have come up, the first dot-com bust, not the next one. And uh, that might come up. But the reason we're together today is because of the Scott's new book, which is called Stretch. And I know you've been on a big book tour, and you know why. It's because people really are interested in what you found and why, which is some organizations and people do really well with very little, and others fail with a lot so much. And I think that's what we'd like to talk about today, because people who are interested in APQC are interested in how you can do more with less. And I would guess most of us have resource constraints. So let's start there, but welcome, Scott. Thanks for having me. Glad you're here. So the first question really is to kind of lay the groundwork for us. You say that people and organizations approach resources in two different ways. One, some are chasing and others are stretching. What's the difference and why is stretching better? Ah. So chasing is this idea that we link our performance to how many resources we have. We think that we need more time or more money or more people, more connections to be more successful. So what happens is we orient our entire business model around trying to acquire as many resources as possible. And I saw this firsthand, of course. I was in the dot-com boom and subsequent bust and I got out there and the entire business model was let's focus our organization on trying to raise as much capital as possible, bring in as many employees each week through the door, get as many customers as, po as possible, even if they weren't necessarily profitable. And that all works really well as long as someone keeps writing lots of checks. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. when those checks stop coming, the entire house begins to crumble. Yeah. Because what those organizations were really good at, and what I worry that so many other companies today, whether it be in tech or other industries, are facing is they get very good at sucking up those resources. And the sense for the dot-com boom was, Every time we raise more money, magically, the value of our company would grow. So we got really good at spending that money, and we tended to squander it. And that's what chasing is all about. It's this notion that we keep going after more, believing that's the key to success. But in contrast, stretching recognizes that what makes companies and people successful is not so much how, how much resources we have, but how we actually use those resources, how we can be creative and engaged with the resources right around us. You see so many times organizations missing all of the abundance, whether it be in people, connections, relationships, information. That's right in front of them. Mm -hmm. Their first instinct is to always go out and find more outside the company mm -hmm. when it turns out there's so much already inside. Yeah. I was thinking about, you know, so many of us haven't been through uh, anything like a dot-com boom and bust. So we come from industries where there usually is a lot more constraints all the time. Um, but I really think that you're... The point is correct because they've been focusing in lean sigma and six sigma for I mean lean and six sigma for a long time. That if you lower the water, which is reduce resources, you can see the rocks and you can know what it is that you need to do to improve. Uh, I got a real deep question for you though, which is everybody who watches this knows I'm real interested in cognitive psychology and how we're all wired. And frankly, I think people are kind of hardwired to want to acquire more and to hold on what they to what they've got. So how do you begin to sort of address that? How do you be, begin to create a stretching mindset inside a company and people? Yeah, and of course, one of the challenges is the situations that many organizations and people are in are very prone to chasing. It's what we call social comparisons mm -hmm. as psychologists. We like to compare ourselves, who's got the shinier building, who's got the nicer office, and these types mm -hmm. of comparisons. Or the bigger budget or the, the most The bigger staff. budget or the bigger job title, the yeah. bigger staff. These, these yeah. types of conversations keep escalating because the reality is, is there's always going to be uh, someone who has more. But when we get into this chasing mindset, we're never satisfied because we keep escalating those comparisons. So mm -hmm. we're wasting a lot of time and energy trying to chase after things that often we don't actually need in order to succeed. So the idea to get into this mindset of stretching is to recognize, one, there's often abundance in front of us if we just kind of look at it and be more creative with, with what's around. Uh, but two, when we think of constraints, we want to run away from constraints. In the land of chasing, constraints are really bad because we judge the worth of ourselves and our organizations and our jobs based off of the amount of resources. Our project is important if there's a lot of resources invested in it. Mm -hmm. But that's the wrong way of thinking. And in fact, 
a number of uh, studies in psychology show that when we face situations of constraints, the mind actually has this freedom to think much more creatively about the resources and objects around us. But when we think about abundance and we surround ourselves with abundance, the brain actually narrows. It thinks about resources only in their conventional ways. So you want to get a nail into the wall, you only think a hammer. You only think of that perfect ideal tool for getting the job done. But when you embrace constraints, you quickly realize, well, I've got a lot of things around. Mm -hmm. I just take the, the shoe mm -hmm. off my foot and I get that nail into the wall. Mm -hmm. That's, I had never heard that before. That's a, that's a great insight. Give us some more examples of organizations that had really, or, and individuals who had big constraints and were able to be more creative as a result. So one of the things I do as an inductive field researcher is I get to... An inductive field inductive researcher. researcher. Tell researcher. us what that means. So that means I get to go study how other people and organizations do their jobs. And mm -hmm. in one research study, I had the pleasure of examining a chain of women's fashion boutiques. Not normally where I would spend most of my oh, time. Oh, good. But I, Here we go. I traveled, good. I, good man. I yeah. traveled around the country, and I went to the most successful store manager in this company, and I said, what is it that makes you so good and effective at your job? He told me his story. He told me a story about a time when he was facing a lot of constraints. He got what everyone in the company considered to be the worst product as possible. It was an ugly dress. It wasn't selling. It was falling off the hangers. Customers would even come in and laugh at it. And a lot of people in that situation would resign themselves and say, I don't have good products to sell. I'm just going to close up and wait until something better comes along. Mm -hmm. Well, what he did is he took a pair of scissors, he cut the straps off, rolled up the dress, tied it with a bow and made a sign that said beach cover-up. It went from a last seller to a best seller. Oh my and what gosh. I find in my research is the most effective employees and the most effective organizations are able to inspire and motivate this type of behavior where people metaphorically cut off the straps. They make conscious, creative, uh -huh. and responsible choices uh -huh. to work with the resources they have to get the job done to solve goals. They don't wait for tomorrow until they have the perfect solution, the perfect resource. They work with what they have today. Yeah. So, I mean, that makes perfect sense to me. I'm thinking back 30, 40 years ago when Southwest Airlines started. They had one plane. And the only way you make money is if you've got people in the seats and the planes flying. You don't make any money when it's on the ground. And so one of the things that they did, which is an old, you know, bench, good benchmarking story, is they went to see how other people with those kind of constraints actually did this. And they learned from the Indianapolis 500 pit crews. This is the fastest way to turn around an airplane. And Southwest Airlines is now, you know, legendary for those kind of successes. So I, I think what you're saying is right. There's... Um, let me, let me ask you a little bit more about what you run into when you tell people this. What kind of reactions are, do you get resistance? Like people say, well, I'm not giving up my budget or I'm not going to let my experts go, which I think is something that all of us have experienced. You know, even if you could, uh, what kind of uh, reaction do you get around this whole question? Yeah, the reaction is going to depend on where the organization tends to be in its life cycle. Mm -hmm. on more entrepreneurial companies immediately get this because they're, they're living these constraints and they recognize They're that, in the garage. Yeah, they, yeah. They, they are literally in the garage, right? right and they right. recognize it's this scrappiness that has made them successful. The danger that I see is as organizations mature and as they acquire more resources, they abandon the very formula that made them successful in the first place. Mm -hmm. So they literally move out of the garage and they might move to a really shiny new office, which is, which is fine, but you've got to ask what type of signals does it send to your culture and what is leadership's responsibility mm -hmm. to keep instilling these types of behaviors that help propel the growth of the company. Mm -hmm. Because often what happens is they mature and they want to show the world we really made it, here's all of our fancy offices, we're going to hire as many people as we can, mm -hmm. and they end up squandering resources. And there's a lot of research in both management and strategy and psychology that shows that when we have a lot of resources around us, we tend not to be as judicious and as good stewards for those types mm -hmm. of resources. Mm -hmm. So the startups immediately say, I get this. This is the life that we're, we're living. Mm -hmm. The larger companies tend to struggle with this because what happens is they start keeping score through chasing. They recognize, yeah, that was when we were really scrappy. But the mm -hmm. question is, what do we do now? Because everyone at work is always looking around and they're judging their success, not by their outputs, but mm -hmm. by how big their teams are mm -hmm. and how big their budgets are, mm -hmm. which is a really bizarre way of thinking about performance. They've lost sight of what their ultimate goal is. And that's what you tend to see as organizations mature. They have, uh, through this process called mindless accumulation, they try and get <laughs> more and more and more 
Meanwhile, the question is, are they making any more progress towards reaching their organizational and personal goals? Mm -hmm. So there, was, there were those in that group. And then there's finally the larger companies that throughout their DNA, throughout their history, they've embraced these ideas, yes. and they've done them through great success. So mm -hmm. it's, all, it's kind of all over the board. Give me some examples of those. A lot of our list, uh, watch, you know, viewers and listeners are people from large companies around the world. What are, who are some examples of those that you think have done a good job of at least trying to maintain a, a stretching mindset? I love a company like Fastenal, which is a multi-billion dollar industrial supply company. And this is a company founded by a gentleman by the name of Bob Kierlin. And mm -hmm. Bob Kierlin grew up under hard times and he worked at his father's auto parts repair store and mm -hmm. he didn't have a lot of money growing up. And I find that with a lot of the successful entrepreneurs, when they end up growing their businesses to large companies, it all started with their, with their upbringing and their values. And yeah. what he did is he instilled a culture of stretching from the very get-go. And some of the things he did might appear a bit draconian, like at first, employees weren't reimbursed for meals when they were traveling for work because he reasoned, well, they need to eat anyway. <laughs> but what he did is he took that money and he invested it back in the people in terms of higher salaries, bigger bonuses. He was mm -hmm. able to scale and grow the business. Because there's a difference. If people are going to be eating on his dime, he reasoned, mm -hmm. they'd be eating a lot differently because they weren't paying the bill. I'm sure so he's this, right. Yeah, so this yeah. really taught a culture that we're going to be good stewards of our resources. And in fact, if you were to have invested $2,100 in his company in 1994, the day it IPO'd, to the day he retired in 2014, that investment would be worth a million dollars. Twenty-one hundred dollars would now be worth a million dollars, and so that—I uh, mean—that's a really nice example of you know thriving on constraints or having that kind of mindset. Mm -hmm. Right, absolutely, and it's you know worked when they were small, and it works now that they're you know valued at over ten billion dollars. Over ten billion. Yes. Okay, so a lot of the people that we work with. Um, don't have unlimited budgets. They're already dealing with constraints. They're knowledge management professionals or they're process improvement professionals and they're running these departments. So tell them again how constraints can lead to creativity. Are there any like techniques you would suggest? Yeah, so the brain functions very differently when it's facing constraints. There's the cliche that necessity is the mother of all invention. And in many respects, that's actually true because when we face constraints, the mind gives itself this freedom to make connections to see resources not as fixed but as very changeable and we can be very innovative and come up with lots of different ways of using resources in unconventional ways. On the other hand, when we surround ourselves with abundance, we tend to default to the most popular or conventional way. The hammer of using is a, a way to put a nail in the wall. Yeah, and that's yeah. the only way that we can think. And there's very little delight in putting using a hammer to put a nail in the wall. But if you come up with something really cool or a different way to do it, uh, my experience is that it's delightful. Yes. The human brain really likes it. Well, it's because we're born to be creative creatures and we really like expressing it. Yeah. But we often don't don't give ourselves that permission because uh -huh. a lot of people would say, "Well, I don't have a hammer to get a nail into the wall. I'm just going to wait." I'm gonna, or I'm going to go look in the garage, yeah. and if I don't have it in the garage, I'll go ask a neighbor, and if a neighbor's not home, yeah. maybe I'll go to the hardware store. Meanwhile, you're wasting all of this time. You're not making any more progress on your goals when you've got a shoe around, you've got a book around. You can easily just get you that nail into the wall. you got the edge of a, a, a hammer. I mean, not a hammer, an edge of, well, anyway, pliers. Edge of a pliers yeah. would work. There's, you know, a shovel if you really have a big nail. Yeah, okay. there's yeah. so many different ways to reach yeah. our goals. And yeah. when we have constraints, we have this this benefit where we give ourselves this freedom to find mm -hmm. multiple paths towards our goals. Mm -hmm. Abundance, we take what psychologists like to call the path of least resistance. We take only the conventional tool, the perfect tool. But the reality is, is we rarely have the perfect tool. No. And so how can we go about getting the work done without the perfect tool? We embrace constraints. We don't try and fight them. We don't say, I need lots of hammers for my team now. Yeah. It's, what do I have that can get the job done yeah. today, right now? Do you like people to use like uh, ideation techniques and things for that? Do you recommend that? Because I think that's very helpful to, like, to help people get their juices flowing a little bit. What yeah, do you? What kind of techniques do you recommend? There's, there's lots of there's lots of different techniques. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, the the one I really like is try proactively asking for constraints instead of running away from them. Oh, Scott! So people aren't going to do that. Well, this is think? what happens is because uh, a lot of a lot of the hesitation is people don't feel capable of being able to work through constraints yeah. and even work better through constraints because constraints is stigmatized. It has a bad word. People are going to think that 
my project's not important because I don't have a lot of people on it. Yeah. But actually, quite the contrary. If you can show that you can get a lot done with what you have, much more kudos oh, to I you. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. I just think that's absolutely true. One of the pieces of advice we give our knowledge management professionals is that don't, you're going to get a problem when you ask for a big budget. If you're unlucky enough for them to give it to you, you've got to better have a darn big value proposition, and there's going to be a lot of visibility and pressure. Why don't you over-deliver on a smaller budget and see, then see what happens? So I, I completely support what you're saying. I think that's, um, we see that in lots of different ways, too. It's kind of hard to tell people, though, they're, you know, ask for a smaller budget. My take on it is just don't ask for a big one unless you're absolutely sure that you can pay off from it. So let's switch gears just a little bit. You have an interesting point in the book uh, about uh, experts and expertise. Tell our uh, viewers about that. Sure. So when we think about forming teams, most of us have instincts that say, I want to put the most expert, most knowledgeable people on the team. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that when you look at the research, that's often the wrong approach. Because what happens is experts have very narrow ways of approaching complex problems. Mm -hmm. So in one study, researchers looked at 165 scientific labs across 10 different countries, and they wanted to ask what seems like a straightforward question, which is, to what extent does a scientist's knowledge in a domain predict the likelihood that they can solve a problem in that domain? Seems straightforward, right? You'd right, expect a, right. a nice, strong, positive relationship. And well, the researchers found a strong relationship, it was actually negative. In other words, the more the scientists knew, the less likely they were to solve that complex problem. The biologists were better at solving the chemistry problems and vice versa. Mm -hmm. There's a very simple psychological explanation for this. It's when you've got experts around, they're very deep, but they're also deep in ways that are blinding. It's what we call yes. cognitive entrenchment. So they only approach problems with specific schemas or specific ways of looking at the world. You put a bunch of what I call outsiders onto the team, and they can see old problems in new ways. So I developed this concept called the multi-context or multi-C rule, which looks at not the depth of experience that someone has, but the breadth of experience. And that tends to predict performance yes. in terms of these teams. Yes. But the reality is, is in mathematical modeling and other type of research backs this up, the way most of us pick our teams, we'd be far better off picking names out of a hat. Than, than we are going for the experts. And that's one reason that all of us are smarter than one of us. And if you can have sort of more breadth, I think open innovation and open marketplaces where you can put out an idea and ask somebody to bid on it with a, a novel solution, I think that's probably why those are popular and do work. At least there's a lot of success stories that have come out of it. And certainly uh, organizations are still using those kind of uh, idea market, you know, when they'll put uh, open marketplaces. Sure. Tell me a little bit about, um, so we talked about expertise. Tell me a little bit about meetings. Everybody goes to a lot of meetings, and you've said that you think a lot of them are very unproductive. We couldn't agree with you more. So tell us why you think that is and what we could do about it. Well, one of the big challenges with meetings is, quite frankly, we're not listening. And we're not listening um, not because we're doing something we shouldn't be doing, but because of the way that the mind works. So there's this effect called the, the next-in-line effect. And the next-in-line effect says that the mind literally shuts down about nine seconds before it's our turn to speak, and as much as nine seconds after it's our turn to nine speak. Nine seconds? That's a long time. It is a long time, and what's happening in those nine seconds is we're busy trying to plan out our speech, plan out our performance. How am I going to say something that might impress the boss? And uh -huh. while we're doing all of this, we're missing very valuable present information that's unfolding right next to us. And then afterwards, we're doing that same type of exercise, although now it's about evaluation. Did I really impress the boss? Did yes. I really say what I wanted to say? Meanwhile, we're not listening to what someone next to us is saying. Mm -hmm. So because of this next in line effect, we have a hard time hearing what people around us are saying. And this is often triggered by the way that we do meetings because what is the probably the most typical way that we run a meeting? We all sit around the table and we say, let's go around the room. Mm -hmm. But when we go around the room, we cue that next in line effect yeah. because you know exactly what your speaking order is. Yes. So as your turn is approaching and those nine seconds are there, wow. you're shutting down from what you're actually what doing. What should we be doing? Because that usually you do that because you want to give everybody a chance to talk. What should we be doing? Yeah, It's okay to give everyone a chance to talk, but you want to instill a much more improvisational mindset into your meeting where... One, first of all, recognize just because of where you happen to be randomly sitting doesn't mean that <laughs> that should really dictate when's the most relevant time for you to speak. 
Yeah. It could be at the beginning of a meeting. It could be at the middle. It could be at the end. It has nothing to do with who your neighbors are. So going yeah. around the table is not the way to do it. Mm -hmm. So what, what is the way to do it is to get people more comfortable saying, we're going to treat this more as an improvisational exercise where instead of going in a set order, people are going to jump in when they have the most relevant information. And one of the things I like to recommend is instead of immediately criticizing or shutting down ideas, for just a moment, suspend belief and say, imagine if it were true what the person who just spoke before me said. And yeah. so this is what we call an improv, the yes and game. Yes. And you affirm yes what they're saying. Yes. Yeah, you affirm what they're saying. Mm -hmm. But what it also tricks you to do is it makes you better listeners because you don't know mm -hmm. when it's going to be the best time to jump in. You don't know what the speaking order is, but you have something to say. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be really attuned to the conversation that's unfolding around you mm -hmm. so you can jump in at the best time. Mm -hmm. I think that, that puts a lot of responsibility on the person to think about when they want to jump in. I'm thinking about the facilitator. You don't want to put people on the spot, but there are some people who won't jump in, even though they've got great ideas. Any thoughts on that? I mean, you try to set an environment. I think that's what you're saying. Let's see if we can create an environment where people give each other space to talk. Mm -hmm. to yeah, I think, I think it's, a, it's a great question because, for me, one of the central roles of a leader is to be an information manager. Mm -hmm. We think of a leader as... That's great. I agree with you, Scott. Yeah, we think of the leader as directing orders mm -hmm. and coming up with a vision. And some no, of that I think stuff we're more like bumblebee, bumblebees. You're just supposed to go around and cross-pollinate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so you want to be that information manager because the, the most ideal group to have is one where you share some information, but most of the information you have is very idiosyncratic. It's unique to a specific person. Yeah. But because of what's called the common information effect, groups tend to talk about the information that they share in common, whereas the most valuable information is the ones that they don't share in common. Mm -hmm. That's the whole purpose of mm -hmm. having the group. So it's really incumbent upon the leader to facilitate a discussion. And even though some people are shy and they don't want to speak, it's okay to say, do you have anything that you want to add? Yeah. Or your background is in such and such. How would you see it from your perspective? So I think it's perfectly fine to prod and poke people and encourage them to say things because what happens is people have these unique perspectives and unless they're raising it, they're not making that contribution to the group and it's really incumbent upon the leader to do that. Yeah, and you know, if you do what you suggested, which is create an environment where other people are going to acknowledge that or say imagine if or are appreciated as opposed to shutting them down, then I think you can pull it off. It's really a very important culture you just talked about. I think it's really important. So one of the things that I was uh, thinking about before we started talking was that you, the whole book is about how some companies can succeed with so little and others fail with so much, right? So can you give us an example of somebody in the same industry, who one who succeeded with so little and one that failed with so much or didn't do as well? Give us an example of that. Sure. Well, let's talk about beer. Everyone, uh, everyone likes beer. and. Uh, Here's a, uh, two companies. One was called Stroh's and one was called uh, Yingling Beer. And they were... I'm embarrassed to say I know both of those. <laughs> well, they were, they were in very similar, very similar positions. They mm -hmm. were fledgling companies and the beer industry was going through quite a transformation mm -hmm. about half a century ago. One company, Stroh's, decided the only way we can succeed is to grow as fast as we can. So what they did is they started acquiring lots of other competitors and they took on a lot of debt and they had a very hard time managing these acquisitions. And what turned out is all of these companies were struggling and you had large producers. Most of the beer industry is controlled by a couple of right. super large, super large right. companies. And Stroh's had a hard time competing. And then when they had a lot of debt, they didn't focus on their operations. They were so focused on who's the next one we're going to snap up that they mm -hmm. took their eye off the ball. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Dick Yingling, who's now one of Forbes' 500 wealthiest individuals because of how he built his company around stretching, said, you know what, I'm not going to grow very fast. I'm going to grow responsibly. So he limited the number of markets that he sells his beer in. And what did that do? That created great viral advertising because mm -hmm. people in neighboring states would say, bring me my beer. So we didn't have to pay for big advertising. In fact, he recognized that if he tried to follow the big players or even Stroh's and spending all of this money on advertising, he would never win because he didn't have that type of money. He mm -hmm. needed to do things differently. He needed to work with what he had. So what he did is he started them buying inexpensive equipment because companies like Stroh's started going out of business. And oh, he and it was, oh, and, yes. And he swooped in and he was able to buy their equipment and he also instilled 
this sense of resource stewardship among his employees. And it's very simple things that people do from yeah. making sure you shut off the lights when, uh, when you leave the office to, mm -hmm. hey, why do we need to mail a bunch of bills to our uh, you know, stores that are selling the beer when our trucks are there delivering the beer anyway? These are things that don't add up to a lot of money but they're very meaningful to employees mm -hmm. because they see this is the type of culture it's that Kaizen. we're building. It's a Kaizen culture. Tiny little grains make a difference. Right, yeah. and those tiny little grains, well, they literally turned into, he yeah. worked with those grains and made them into, <laughs> yeah. into delicious beer. And he's continuing to grow and continue to expand at a time when so many of his competitors went belly up or were bought. And he turned himself into the largest American producer of beer right now. That's a terrific story. And That's he's not even national yet, so yeah. he's got so much more room to go. He realizes we don't need to do it all overnight. Yeah. Unlike you think about the Silicon Valley is stories he privately we were held? About. Is he privately held? Yeah, it's privately yeah. held, and privately he's had held. lots of opportunities to sell out. Oh, I'm sure. And he sure. said, that's not, that's not in my plan. I don't want to... I want to keep control and I want to give it to my family and that's, mm -hmm. that's what your goals are. Mm -hmm. Whereas you compare this to the venture model that we started our conversation with, it's yeah. let's grow as quickly as possible, let's take other people's money. We don't reflect what is it that we're trying to do with our businesses and our yeah. organizations. He, he was very mindful of what his goals are and he's gone out and succeeded in meeting them. Yeah, and, and he wanted to build an organization that kind of reflected his own values, it kind of sounds like. We have an icon, which I know you're aware of in Texas, called Bluebell Creameries, and Bluebell Ice Cream is, is the you know, state ice cream. And they grew the same way. They had many, many offers to, uh, to sell out. Unilever and others have tried to buy them many times. And while they've run into a few problems recently, it's because of growth. But they let people, you used to ship Bluebell and dry ice to your friends in Colorado <laughs> who'd been down here. So they grew the same way. So they're, they're, they're a nice example of that, too. The, um, I'm going to switch gears again. One of the other things that you mentioned in the book, which I thought was very important from a personal perspective, was uh, we tend to think the worst of people instead of the best of people. What is that all about? And how can we fix that? So let's say you've got an employee, and she shows up late to work. Mm -hmm. What's the first thing that goes through your mind? Mm -hmm. She's lazy, she's irresponsible, mm -hmm. maybe she was out the night before partying, mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. Not me, I, but anyway, yes, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, one, might, one might think that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Now, you're late to work, mm -hmm. and you, you're at, you have access to your situation. You know maybe there was a really bad accident on, on the way. Yeah. So what happens is, because we have access to our own situations, when it comes to observing bad things that other people do, we explain our bad behaviors through the situation. Mm -hmm. We explain other people's bad behaviors through something about them individually. Some it's an character. indictment on their character, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, interestingly enough, when it's about successes, we reverse that. Successes are all about something we did. We worked really hard, right. or we're, we're really right. smart. But we observe other people's successes, and they got lucky, mm -hmm. or they had a connection. Mm -hmm. These are what we call attribution errors. The mm -hmm. challenge that we have when we're setting expectations for people is we don't have access to their situational knowledge. So when we see them at their best, it's the situation. Mm -hmm. When we see them at their worst, it's the person themselves. Yeah. So we put on the dunce cap on people, where we begin to start expecting them to be and to perform at their worst. And a whole host of research tracing all the way back to the 1960s in elementary education, yes. which has been replicated in businesses, it's been replicated mm -hmm. in governments and military settings, shows that people live up or down to the expectations mm -hmm. that we set for them. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do when we're stretching is elevate those expectations, try and spark what I call positive prophecies, where when we give someone the benefit oh, of the doubt... Oh, that's nice, positive prophecies. Yeah, we give them that benefit of the doubt, we spark these positive prophecies. So you might hear, oh, we've got a new employee and he's a jerk. Well, you've never even met this person, and once you put that narrative into your brain, yeah. You're going to interact with that person that turns them into that jerk. Replace <laughs> it with a positive prophecy. Mm -hmm. They're a wonderful person. You're going to interact them, interact with them in a much warmer way great that will point. help self-fulfill that positive prophecy. Yeah, that's great. You've shared actually quite a few techniques with us on how to move from a, a mindset of chasing, which I think is to stretching, and I think it's important personally and professionally to do that. Can you share some other techniques with us that you think would be useful? You have a whole set of exercises at the, in the back of the book about how to do that. Yeah, right. The last chapter of Stretch is 12 different exercises. I'll share with you some of my favorites. First is we talked about the importance of having outsiders on teams. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes the question is, well, what happens when we have a lot of experts around? How can we create this outsiderness 
within our experts. Good point, yeah. Well, so I like to say go explore. And this is an exercise where you want to try and have experiences that you wouldn't otherwise have to start seeing connections between resources. So for example, go to a conference in a completely different industry. Mm -hmm. Or go have lunch with someone who has a similar job but in a different company. And what you're going to realize is a lot of the problems that you're facing at work are similar problems in other industries and other companies, but you're approaching them differently. Mm -hmm. So this gives you a great way of learning how to do it. Mm -hmm. Another one of my exercises is, is to go take a break. And we often think that unless you're in front of your computer doing real work, you're not actually working. This is a relic of chasing, of course, where mm -hmm. the more minutes you spend, the better results you're going to have. Yeah. But a whole host of research shows the importance that when you take a break and you do something mindless, it could be as simple as coloring or doodling or even or going for or a walking. walk. Yeah, go for a walk is yeah. one, of, one of my favorites. Yeah. The brain is still processing information, but at a subconscious level. It's still thinking about your projects, but it's thinking about those projects with the benefit of making connections and seeing relationships mm -hmm. that you wouldn't otherwise see mm -hmm. because you're giving yourself that freedom to relax and not so much focus on the task. Mm -hmm. But it's still working. The mm -hmm. mind is still working, but mm -hmm. you're, you're looking at it in, in very new ways. Mm -hmm. So taking a break, right, you have the joke of who's playing on the phone or back in the day when I started working, it was who's playing solitaire on their, on their Windows machine. And mm -hmm. you would say, ah, they're obviously <laughs> not working. Well, for 10 or 15 minutes every few hours, we can consider it work. Right, right. And then I guess another one of my favorite exercises is to just say no. So our first instincts at work are, let's try and get the most that we can possibly have. And I'm going to build an empire, right? You hear that a lot. You mm -hmm. want to kind of build an empire, show that you've got the most staff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So be proactive with your, with your supervisor and actually say not only no to more resources, but I'm going to deliver this project for... 5% less than you've offered me. Yeah. I'm going to turn it in a couple of days early, mm -hmm. and I'm going to do it with one less person. Mm -hmm. And what, pe what happens is people realize they can not only do the work, they can do the work more effectively, and it gradually builds up their confidence to realize that trying to get more is not the ultimate yeah. goal. And in fact, yeah. sometimes it gets in the way. It's about trying to do more with what we have and go after goals that we care about, not goals that we think we should care about because lots mm -hmm. of people around us in companies and in life generally, I would say, are chasing. Yeah. All right, Scott. That's all the time we have for today. I guess that was a constraint that we have to live with. I'm sorry about that. But um, I think if people want more, and we do, I can highly recommend Stretch. For a book who's, uh, it's a book for somebody who really wants to figure out how to do more with less. And for me, it was uh, personally rewarding to read it, not just professionally rewarding to read it. So there was a lot, because so much of... Uh, what we do in life is accumulate stuff, and the more stuff you've got, the more stuff you have to manage. So well, this gave me ac actually some techniques for maybe getting rid of some of that stuff. So I highly recommend the book to all professionals and to anybody who wants less uh, clutter in their lives. There's a whole movement around that. And Scott's got his own uh, website where you can find out some more resources and other ideas. And, of course, the last chapter in the book is with exercises. So... Join me in thanking Scott for jo uh, joining us today, and it was a great interview. Thank you, Scott. Thanks so much for having me.